So thank you, I'm really excited about this session and I'm thrilled again that Jennifer and her team have made this a priority and made sure it's the space for this in the schedule over the next few days. Thank you. So I wanna introduce the three panelists and I wanna just give you a quick introduction to the topic before I really dig in with them. So let's start with, we've got Matt Henderson. Welcome, Matt. So Matt Henderson, a United States Navy veteran, wildlife photographer, and Team Rubicon leader. One of Matt's most remarkable contributions is his work with Team Rubicon, a veteran-led disaster response organization. Matt has been a dedicated volunteer, filling the role of NorCal communications lead and often stepping up as incident commander on operations. Let me try the incident commander. Is that better? Trying to, trying to get the accent, but not really. On operations, he has been instrumental in organizing and executing several disaster response projects, including a significant operation in Grizzly Flats. This project saw 70 volunteers working daily for a month, supporting a community devastated by wildfires. Matt's dedication to helping people impacted by wildfires extends beyond his work with Team Rubicon. In addition to his 17 years covering wildfires, as a photojournalist, he has consistently been at the forefront of relief efforts, offering his time, skills, and compassion to support affected communities. So welcome, Matt. Who have we got next? Jackie. So Jackie Jorgensen is the founder and ex executive director of the Volunteer Fire Foundation, a FEMA-funded Sonoma County nonprofit devoted to recruiting volunteer firefighters, retaining the ones we have, so important, and supporting their health and well-being along the way. As a survivor of illness that stemmed from her exposure to toxic chemicals at Ground Zero in New York City following 9-11, Jackie is particularly invested in helping firefighters reduce their chemical burdens and cancer risk. Through her leadership, the Volunteer Fire Foundation is a co-sponsor and administrator of the groundbreaking Firefighter Detoxification Pilot Program, which has produced extremely promising data, or data, in its first two rounds. <laughs> I'll get there. A fourth generation Californian, Jackie lives in Santa Rosa with her husband and five year old son, who is, of course, thoroughly obsessed with firefighters. Welcome, Jackie. And Noelani. Noelani Ahia is a healer and activist who works to protect what we love Aina, Kai, Vai, Evie, and each other. Trained in traditional East Asian medicine, she's been delivering acupuncture and herbal medicine to the Maui community for 15 years. In 2017, she co-founded the Mona Medic Healers Hui with Dr. Kalama Nihau, and in 2019, spent eight months on Mona Kaya, tending to our Lahui. Genealogically tied to Lahaina, Maui, she founded the Maui Medic Healers Hui after the devastating 2023 fires. Building communities of care is central to how she walks in the world, always guided by ancestors and the whispers of an ancient murmur. Heidi Mai. All right, so I'm thrilled. I can't wait to turn it over. I just want to give just a little bit of the, the background to the session. Um, we've got some support resources over on the side table. So um, we talked before around, you know, the four areas that Hummingley's extremely passionate about. One of them is sustaining the supporters, right? So in my disaster, we tried everything we could to sustain and prevent burnout of our teams, and the reality was we were still burning people out. So that led to some research looking at other communities, um, others working in disaster, and really highlight some of the risks. So, you know, it's really sobering. The impacts are very, very real to those leaders working in this, to their teams, their organizations, and especially to the communities that we support. But in terms of the hopeful piece, there's a lot that we have learned that we can do better and differently. So all of that is packaged up for you. Um, there's a resource that you can take away on the side table. So just wanted to give you that little background. And then lastly, just how we're gonna go about the session a little bit differently. So again, as a cognitive scientist, right, I think about the fact that when our brains are full and we have like energy and time is scarce, Right, we need to have our learning and our tools and resources easily accessible under pressure. And so I've asked the panelists to really think on these three things or to come up with three of these, a one of each, a story around sustaining themselves as leaders, right, in disaster recovery, a mental image 
right? And something practical, a practical tip that they can take away because these are the things I know that will stick and will be easily accessible, um, especially when you've got this amazing conference full of a wealth of information and great speakers. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hand to each one at a time, obviously, to the panellists, and it's panellists pick. So they're going to pick one of these, a story, an image, or a strategy, something practical. You might get elements of all three, and we probably won't get time to, to hear all three from each person. So I'm going to encourage you to tap everyone on the shoulder, some of these amazing panellists, um, over the course of the next couple of days and ask them what they didn't get to share. All right? So let's go with panellist picks. Let's start here, Jackie. You're the closest. Jackie. Story, image, or strategy? I'm a storyteller, so we'll start there. Um, you know, <laughs> the story that I wanted to share with you is just kind of how Volunteer Fire Foundation came to be. And, you know, I, as many of you know, Sonoma County is... Um, has been on fire more often than not in the last several years since 2017. And, you know, the first round, it was kind of like, okay, what can we do to help the firefighters? Being that I was just outside of New York and indeed in New York through 9-11 and watched what happened with the firefighters there. I call it like the heroification of them, you know, the upwelling of really genuine gratitude and then the quick forgetting. And so during our first major fire, I reached out to a firefighter friend and he said, hey, if you're serious about wanting to help them, when the smoke clears, remember the volunteer firefighters because they are doing everything the paid firefighters do, but they're trying to swing it on a pancake breakfast a year. And so I started kind of putting seeds, you know, planting seeds and putting things in motion. I thought, hey, we could do a fundraiser, but like who gets the giant novelty check on stage at the end of the benefit concert, right? It's like I just have to find the existing nonprofit that handles this, that understands all of the varied needs of the different fire, volunteer fire departments and can kind of calibrate their needs and the discrepancies in, in resources and funding. And to my shock and horror, I learned that that did not exist in Sonoma County. Indeed, it doesn't exactly exist anywhere in the United States for an entire region of volunteer fire departments. And so it was kind of like, oh no, this isn't, I think, I mean like, show of hands, how many people have accidentally started nonprofits in the last <laughs> five years? Um, I think that's how most of them begin, right? <laughs> that sort of like, oh shit moment, forgive my language. Um, and here we are, right? And so I, you know, and I was like, okay, we're gonna start with a, you know, fundraiser. And then COVID slammed the door shut and I went into fetal position for months until our third fire in three years began. And you would think like that was my moment, that was my activating moment. And instead I thought, oh my God, life is no longer sustainable here. And I have a baby and I can't raise him. We, he can't even go outside. And here we are again, first time, lightning in a bottle, second time, what are the chances? Third time, we gotta move. And I was sobbing, sobbing, every day, just grieving, mourning, leaving this place that I love so much. And it finally, you know, I'm, every day I'm looking on, on the Purple Air app for the little pocket of the most breathable air to get my son outside, and I find it in a place, in a park that I'd never been to, and I couldn't figure out why the name was familiar. It was in a town I don't even frequent. But there it was, it was kind of yellowish green, and okay, let's go for it, and I took him for a walk, and we got to the top of that first hill, and we were surrounded by burnt manzanita. And I looked around, and I remembered, and I knew instantly why the name of that park was familiar, and it's because it was Foothills Regional Park in Windsor. And it's the place where just one year prior, our volunteer firefighters swelled the ranks of our paid firefighters, and together they held the line. The line that otherwise there would have been nothing to stop that fire from burning the entire town of Windsor down and indeed burning its way all the way to the coast. And so it was that galvanizing moment of like, we stay, we fight. So that, that last activity that we did was super interesting because I got to hear from a couple of people that have been living on adrenaline for quite some time. Um, how many people out here have ever heard the term change your socks? Anybody? Okay, if, if you've been in the military, you've probably heard that, that term 
And if you've ever watched a Vietnam movie like Forrest Gump, you probably heard it. Uh, Lieutenant Dan tells, tells Forrest, there is one piece of grunt gear that can, uh, that can save your life, and that is socks. So uh, there, and in, in, that, uh, in that scenario, they were talking about socks. Uh, if they get wet, they can cause disease and that kind of thing. So for Team Rubicon, we've kind of adapted that to change your socks. For us, means that it is a meaningful, purposeful break from what you're doing. So as, as I'm sure everybody in here knows that we will go and go and go, living on adrenaline for months at a time. And, uh, and that starts to wear on you. You start, uh, your, your mental faculties start going down. You haven't seen your family in a while. So we actually have rules on how long uh, we can stay in the field until we have to take a break and it's scheduled. And as a leader, it's very important to make sure that you do schedule those, those breaks for the people who are following you, and in my case, for the volunteers. Because as volunteers, we don't ever want to go home until we've taken care of every person, until every mess is cleaned up. We don't want to leave that. But as a leader, you have to go and say, hey, listen, you're going to be out in the field for 10 days, and then you are going to leave this place for two days. You're not going to get called. You're not going to, you're not going to think about it for two days because you need to go and take care of your family and take care of religious needs and your mental needs and just de-stress. It's incredibly important to make sure that you take that time. And it's not just a, a regular, I'm going to go home at night and get some sleep and then I'm going to be back up at five o'clock in the morning. It's I'm taking a couple days off to take care of all of the things that I've been kind of pushing to the side. It's just in, in, as important for you as it is to your family members who a lot of times we're, we're off working and they're kind of, they're sitting at home wondering where, where mom or dad is. Um, and it's, it can make a huge mental difference. So that time is used so that you can then return to the field. And even as a leader, you need to take that, that time off, but you can return out to the field back at 100% so that you're ready to serve that community as best possible, knowing that everything else that you're normally dealing with in life is all taken care of and you're coming forward and helping at 100%. Thank you so much. Um, aloha, I'm Noilani Ahia. Um, I just wanted to start by acknowledging my ancestors that I bring with me from all sides of my, of my genealogies, my mother and my father, and I wanted to acknowledge the ancestors of this Aina that were on here because those ancestors are so much a part of how we resource ourselves and how we can resource ourselves if we're connected and tuned in to their voices. Um, thank you so much for having us here and for inviting us to share with you folks. It's really um, an important part of the healing process for us to be with other people. And I have to say, uh, this always happens to me. I'll be in go, go, go mode and as soon as I travel and get somewhere else where I kind of breathe a little bit, I get all emotional. So, um, if I'm emotional, that's part, of, that's part of why, because this is an opportunity for us to discharge. And so on that, one of the strategies that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is um, how trauma gets stored in our bodies. I, I'm trying to move away from the term mental health because trauma, it, trauma first of all, is not a mental health disorder. It's uh, our responses to trauma are natural and normal, and we need to let our folks in our communities know that what they're feeling is normal. Um, of course, there are mental health diagnoses that have to be addressed as well, but many of those things live in our bodies and in our physiologies. And in the teachings of Peter Levine, he talks about how wild animals, when, they, when there's a prey and another animal is attacking it, but it survives afterwards, it shakes itself off. And it literally discharges those stress hormones. It literally moves those hormones out of their body, and then they carry on, and they're fine. But humans, in modern day anyways, I don't think our indigenous ancestors did this so much. I think they had practices and protocols to do this work. But in, in the modern world, we're told to push it down. In, in Hawaii, they would say, pa'akavaha, just keep your mouth shut. Don't share, don't be a sissy, don't be a girl, don't cry. But all of those 
those things are ways that are contributing to our increased trauma. And if we don't release and discharge those emotions from our body, they turn into dis-ease later on. And this is part of what we're trying to protect against. So I'm gonna have everybody just stand up for a minute and just shake it off. You've been sitting for a long time. I don't know about you, but my body's stiff, especially from flying. Just shake it off a little bit. Just stretch out. Yawn if you have to. Ooh, yawning is a way of discharging too. So is laughing. So is getting mad. Getting mad is normal. It's okay. As long as you don't hurt people. Yeah. Whatever you're feeling is okay. And that's part of the message. So um, you can stay stand, just stay standing for a minute. Just rock if you need to. Part of the thing that we have to do when we're, we're in our healing mode is sometimes change our perspective. And that sometimes just means looking around, looking up at the ceiling, connecting into the earth. We do a lot of breath work in our clinic. So we have a, um, my medic healers who he has a clinic that is open seven days a week. Folks are trying to talk me into bringing it down to five days a week so I can have more rest. We're still negotiating that. But part of the model is that not only are we treating fire survivors, but we're treating each other. So I get acupuncture every single week, which let me tell you, for the 16 years that I practiced as an acupuncturist, I rarely got. But my body is telling me now, you better go get on, in that table or in that chair and regulate yourself, or you're not going to be able to keep going. I go to therapy every single week. And I do talk story. We stopped calling it therapy in the, in the early days because of the stigma, especially in our Polynesian community. So we just called it talk story. It's a little bit gentler and easier for people to receive. We do walk story. And I heard you say something about that before, walk and talk. These are all the kinds of practices that help uh, sort of take the stigma away and allow people to connect into their bodies where the trauma is actually living. So sit back down for just a second. I'm going, do, I'm going to do one quick thing before I pass the mic around. I want you to just put one hand on your belly and one hand on your heart. In Hawaiian thinking, your belly is called your na'au, and it's a source of wisdom. It's where our ancestors speak to us through. And funny thing, in Western medicine, they've just discovered this thing called the enteric nervous system. It's a second brain in your gut. So our kupuna, our ancestors, were onto something. And I want you to just close your eyes, and I want you to breathe into your na'al, into your belly, and just notice. Free from judgment. Just notice if there's a message, if there's inner guidance in your na'al. And I want you to breathe into your heart center. And just notice all the things that are there, all the feelings, memories, emotions, all the aloha you have for your, your ohana, your family, and the people in your community. And then I want you to connect those two, your heart and your na'al. Let them talk to each other. Let them inform you. Let them inform your decision making. And then gently just bow your head to your na'au and to your heart. Sometimes we just have to set the mind down for a minute because it's so full. And let your truth be your guide. Let your ancestral wisdom be your guide. Let your heart and your aloha be your guide. And 
You can stay like this as long as you need. I'm going to pass the mic. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Is that going? I just want to share a story that came up as you were talking, I think, between the three of you. I think how important it is for us to be able to just normalize and realize how challenging this work is. Jennifer said before, I've, I've not come across a recovery leader who has found this work easy, right? So with part of that research, I remember thinking, is it just us? And of course the answer was no. So in Aotearoa, you know, and, and indigenous people do it much better, right? They have a holistic approach to health and well-being. But our Pākehā are white people in New Zealand, right? We have a, a, a saying, a number eight wire, the idea that we should be so self-sufficient that we can fix anything with a piece of fencing wire, right? We don't ask for help. It's just not in our DNA, right? Australia has something similar. When I came here to the US, I heard about John Wayne, the whole John Wayne complex. Went to Japan after the tsunami, and people there said, we have the samurai complex. We don't show weakness. And when I sat and talked with someone in Japan, I was really worried that culturally I might get it wrong, right, in this interview. And I was asking her around, you know, saying this is what we're experiencing. Is this something your team or you are experiencing also? And she started kind of jiggling around the room and chanting. And I thought, oh, what have I done wrong? You know how you do? Like, maybe I'll put my foot in it somehow. And the interpreter said, no, no, she's saying I am human. I am human. And she said, once she settled down, she said, you know, the first year I had all this energy and this motivation and I was just so desperately driven to support my community and what they're going through. And the second year, you know, I had the passion and the motivation, but I'd lost the energy. And by the third year, I think, what is wrong with me? Like, where is all this energy and passion and motivation gone? I'm, I'm losing it. And I thought I was alone. So she asked me to dinner and she invited her team and said, tell them what you told me. Right? So just knowing that it's normal, you're in a room full of people who have been through and have gone through something just as challenging. So you're not alone. So I want to pass again, story, image, or strategy? I think the strategy is, especially when things are brand new, is finding, <laughs> well, first acknowledging the fact that we're probably mostly cut from a very similar cloth, which is we feel called to do all of the things precisely at the same moment. And, you know, it's like trying to, you know, eat an elephant in a single bite. And, you know, the first meeting that I had, I was brainstorming with the fire chief. It was the moment when like the dots connected of like, oh no, this isn't a benefit. This is a nonprofit. What now? And, you know, the only thing that kind of kept me going was that I had found my person who was going to help me fuel this because within a few moments of speaking, he switched from saying, you should really do that to, well, the first thing we might want to look at is, and that we meant everything to me. And so we started mapping out, you know, what our objectives were and what a dream scenario would look like. What do these volunteer firefighters need? Because I'm not from the fire service. I'm very much an outsider. And I was never going to come in and dictate to them what their needs were. And so he's, you know, he's like, oh, it'd be incredible. Like we need training um, reimbursement or subsidization because these trainings are really expensive, but they're supposed to check all the same boxes as the paid folks and they're doing it out of pocket, like that's not fair. Or, you know, oh, like the mental health piece, or, you know, and I'm coming at it from my 9-11 chemical sponge experience of understanding, wait, there's a way to get this stuff out of our bodies of like, in what dream scenario would I be able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a research pilot for firefighters using the same detox protocol that got jet fuel out of my body? You know, and like, what about a documentary film that tells the story of the volunteer fire service in the U.S. and how critical and simultaneously, un, you know, tenable and tenuous it is right now? And what if we did, the, you know, and I'm just, we were riffing and riffing. And of course, I wanted to do everything from the jump with no money, no team. <laughs> and so having to actually submit to the flow of what this was going to be and it's great unfolding. And what's wild is now with, the, you know, we're four years in, we're running the pilot. 
we're, we've done two rounds and the results are beyond what we ever thought. We're getting PFAS from the highest level back into normal range, these forever chemicals, right? Like the, we got a FEMA grant, which is funding all of these trainings and certifications and mental health resiliency. It's the first FEMA grant that's ever been awarded, the FEMA, a FEMA SAFER grant, which is for staffing of adequate response, you know, for firefighters. First time they ever funded mental health resiliency was our grant, right? And it's like, so we're actually doing it. The documentary hasn't happened yet, but I'm just like holding that. It's going to happen in due time and allowing yourself the best you can to just release into truly all things in due time. So uh, I recently responded as the incident commander to my first high-level incident, it was going to be a 30-day operation where we had uh, 70 people on the ground per day flying in from all over the country. And when when we respond, we're seven days a week, so we don't have weekends. And while we're developing this, I, I was really pushing to, to take over this operation. I said, no, I'll stay the whole 30 days. I'll work it out with the family. And I just want to do the whole thing. I'm very passionate about the, about the operation. So, and of course, they said you absolutely cannot stay for 30 days working 30 days straight. So what uh, I did my my first turn. So I said, okay, let me let me do the first third of it, and then I'll go home, and then I'll do the last third. And they agreed with that. So I get there, and we're we are full stream. People flying in from all over the country. I've got uh, I'm dealing with the media and dealing with all of my section chiefs. We we run on the incident command system, so I had all my my section chiefs and and also dealing with Team Rubicon at the national level and reporting back to them. And I'm going and going, and you're, you're awake until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and then you're up again at, at 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, and it's, you know, repeats. And that last day, and I'm actually wearing my, my if you look, and if you, if you ask out there, I'll take my shoes off, and you can see. They actually say, change your socks on there. It's Team Rubicon socks, and they say, change your socks. And so I always wear them on my last day before I go home, just to remind myself. So it wasn't until I'm driving home and I'm going, holy shit, that was crazy. The, the whole thing, going up into the area where we were and seeing the destruction and, and dealing with all of the other things, it wasn't until I started going home that I realized, wow, I really do need this break. And I think that it's important, again, as leaders, that, that we show those who we are leading that we also need breaks. We are not, we are not gods. You know, we are just like them and that we also need breaks. So um, it, was a, it was a big learning experience for me. And I went home and, and spent my, my 10 days with my, with my big great Dane and we snuggled on the couch. And, and then when it got time to go back, I was fired up again. I, I had been... Uh, you know, following following along on some of our communications with what was going on, not trying not to intercede in them, but uh, on the way when I got back there, man, I was a hundred percent again and fired up and just uh, as a leader, you have to show people that that I need breaks and, uh, and it, it really worked out. So I learned a big lesson on that one. Thank you for that. Yeah, breaks are important. Um, I'm still learning that one. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit of a story about community care, um, and it's so important to me because, like everyone has said, none of us can do it alone. And I think in the in the midst of disaster, we we really find that out um, on the most primal level. Um, but you know, our people as Kanaka Maoli came from community living. We have what's called an ahupua'a, which is a land division from the Mauka to the Makai, from the mountains to the sea. And we live together, not to romanticize, but in, in some relative harmony with infrastructure for feeding ourselves, for clothing ourselves, for making sure we had shelter. Uh, and, and pretty much everybody in that system was taken care of. We didn't have unsheltered. We didn't have um, the things that, that uh, peril us today under a Western capitalist, imperialist system. And so when the fires happened and the hubs popped up, this was an opportunity for folks to remember what it like 
what it's like to be cared for by a village. In this modern world, everybody goes home at night after work and cooks dinner. Why? In the village, these people have the skills, they cook the food. These people have the skills to grow the food. These people have the skills to provide the medicine. These people have the skills to do the child care. We got to see that in action. And while everyone was in incredible trauma, there was also something very, very joyful and there was a remembering that happened of how the world could be different. How we could reimagine in a modern world using this ancient technology of care. It wasn't rocket science. It didn't require anyone with a PhD. It was simply people caring for one another. And this community of Lahaina already had that infrastructure. This community was so strong to begin with, despite all the colonial trauma, which still exists. You know, and I, I just wanted to point out, Jennifer, thank you so much for acknowledging that our community had that language. Most indigenous communities have that language and have that infrastructure. But most of those things were made illegal up until a few decades ago. So we're still a people who are remembering who we were and putting that back together and still being challenged to this day. But the pieces of community care where we took care of one another, where we didn't ask for your insurance card, we didn't care if you had a license, we just knew if you needed care, we were gonna take care of you. And if I needed food, the kitchen was gonna feed me. Whatever people needed, everybody stepped up to make sure that needs were met to the best of our capability under horrific and insane conditions. And that is the vision of what many of us in the community are trying to work towards building. And we can do it. We can all do it in every community. There's no reason not to. It's not rocket science. It's just aloha. Thank you. All right, I want to thank each and every one of you, Jackie, Matt, Noalani, for sharing your thoughts, your insights, your hard-won learning through all of this. You know, we say when it comes to disaster, it is the locals on the ground. They are the glue in the communities. They are the people who drive recovery, right? And when we lose them because we burn them out, we lose something really precious, not only because they're precious people, right, but we lose that for our community. So in New Zealand, we talk about a whānui, right? Your meeting house is held up by the pole in the middle, the strong piece of the structure, the pole. When that falls over, right, we lose something incredibly important for the community. So, you know, making sure that we keep a focus on... We're very good at externally focusing on the community, which is vital, but making sure that we look after those and sustain those that are vital to a community along the way. And ending on a hopeful point, right? Post-traumatic growth. It's not just about preventing damage. If we put the right support in place, then we end up with growth to our community, to those that are responding. So huge thank you. Kia ora koutou.